I'm joined in the studio by Live 95 FM's Lendon Ean and Ronnie Long and on the line by Live 95 FM's Mike Ahern, all parts of the sports team. Um, but we're here on a more sombre occasion and that is to pay tribute to uh, our late colleague in sport, Tony McMahon, who passed away uh, yesterday. Um, well, gentlemen, good morning to you. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Joe. Uh, Len, a sad occasion. Sad occasion, Joe. Um, Tony was an integral part of the sports team, as you know. Uh, and we were, we were together uh, since 1978 when we joined uh, Big L. And we went from Big L then on to John DeMann and Radio Lemony. And we were 10, 11 years with, with John DeMann. Uh, Ronnie I was down on that original team with me as well. And uh, yeah, to, we've, we've many happy memories, Joe, uh, of Tony. Uh, as you know, Tony had Alzheimer's and uh, he suffered with Alzheimer's for seven years before he died there yesterday, you know. So it's, he got it when he was 58 years of age, which is a very young age uh, to get it when he died at 65. It's tragic when it afflicts anyone, but when it afflicts a mind as razor sharp as Tony's, it's particularly difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. He was, as you know, for the one-liners, he was absolutely brilliant. You know, you'd never, in an argument, you'd never best him, you know. And he always had the sense of humour, the always, the little quip, you know. And, and uh, uh, he was, he was, he was superb, and very articulate. I would say one of the most articulate members of the sports team. And it's amazing that we stayed together, Joe, from, from that time, 78, right up through, they, they were the pirate days, and right up through then to, to uh, outside to the radio station out in Dora Doyle uh, with Jim Ledan and Jim Wallace, and then um, uh, in here, you know, it's, it really is amazing. Ronnie, Tony <clears throat> was an outstanding natural broadcaster, wasn't he? Yes, and he could do any sport. I think this, and he had a knowledge of all sports. His love, of course, was Belenanti, and we'll come to that maybe in a while. But his major, he had, of course, horse racing and national hunt racing. Cheltenham was a major venue for him. He loved going there. But it was the early days of the, of the rugby when the club championship I win the days when everyone thought the Dublin clubs were going to dominate. And I know Tony took great satisfaction from that. He, he mean, all oh, the glimmery clubs won again today, you know. And he was really uh, buoyed up by, by the success when all the club grounds were full. I think people used to tune in in huge numbers every Saturday morning to hear his racing preview. Oh, he's, he was a great tipster, Joe. Uh, he really was. Um, Number of fellas, oh, when I'd go to the, the, the matches uh, later on in the rugby matches, they'd, they'd say, would you, would you thank Mr. McMahon, please? And all the, I remember an old timer there one September. Would you thank Mr. McMahon? He gave me, gave me great tips there. He's four in a row. I said, great tips. He says, I put a, put a, I put a pound on. He says, and now I'd be very wealthy now for the rest of the week. I, he tipped the winner of the Grand National one year, Joe. And uh, a lovely little story, actually. Anne Banbury uh, used to give us free tips. And she gave Tony a 500 euro free tip. And Tony, uh, Tony put it on the winner of the national, and he donated that to charity, uh, to to a girl f for um, cystic who was actually she died of cystic fibrosis. But at the time, um, he he gave the the five hundred euro free bet, um, and uh, t for that particular charity, Kira was her name, Kira Kelleher. And uh, it was known as Kira's Crusade, a, a lovely, lovely uh, gesture from Tony. But, yeah, he was a great tipster. And, in fact, when we were out in, 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 in Dora Doyle, he, because he, uh, we used to do the sports individually in, on the morning, in the morning um, out in Dora Doyle, and he said, look, Denine, you know nothing about horses. He said, so what you'll do is you pick a horse, and he said, we'll call it Denine's Disaster. And Denise is that, so I saw his pick at a longer shot, you know. Didn't he win a 20 to 1 at one stage? Yeah. <laughs> so he always had, he was always the ball hopper, Joe. And Ronnie, he was almost lyrical on the air. I don't think it's going too far to say that he just had a style which drew the listener in. Yes, and I think it was uh, instantaneous. I, I actually, I don't think he planned it. I think it was just naturally it came to him, and he was. He, and each and every one of us, the two of us here, I say, were often at the end of his ball hops. And uh, I, I think I know I used to enjoy the ball hops. He'd set you up, and then, and you would get a fairly hard fall. But it was all in fun. I don't think there was we ever had a crossword any of us. Uh, with any or any of each other, but it, it was a tremendous camaraderie, and 
I would, it would be fair to say that Tony was a leader of that camaraderie. Now, in 2006, Tony was given a special award, the Jim Upton Media Award uh, at the Limerick Sports Service Awards. Uh, and uh, he chatted uh, after uh, that award that evening. I never really considered myself as, as somebody who would appear on, on uh, tonight's kind of list. Uh, I have to say that uh, a lot was made of um, the variety of, of, of things I was involved in. Um, but the most fun I ever had, I have to say, and I've often said it, uh, was with my day, with days with Battle Rovers. Absolutely fabulous. A cast of characters yeah, you couldn't just believe in. And there wasn't a day you weren't roaring and laughing. And we did an awful lot of good things, uh, remember. We, tra- we traveled, we, we took teams to Germany. I brought our German hosts back to Limerick on four occasions. Uh, we won all the local trophies. Um, the one that eluded us is, of course, the big one, the FEI, and we're still hopeful that uh, we'll be around to see that one come to hand. I think it will because it's a very good young uh, setup at the moment with Battle Ninety Rowers. I'd love to see that. But uh, that for me was was uh, those were those were really enjoyable days with Bala. I'm still a fan, and I still toddle along to the park every now and then and give them an old roar and a shout. You know, and it's great to see them doing so well. The voice of Tony McMahon on a special night for him in 2006 when he received the Jim Upton Media Award for his services to uh, broadcasting uh, on various Limerick radio stations. And Len, you have an anecdote. I have, uh, particularly with Ballad, uh, Dr. Mick Crow, who was, uh, doctor was only an honorary title, as you know, Mick Crow and Tony and the Valnanti lads went on, on tour. They went to Germany on one particular occasion. They stayed overnight for, for two nights. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Mick Tony was looking after looked after he was the, the organiser he was a great organiser as you know but he looked after all the passports for the lads uh, and at half time in this particular match this German they were playing this German team uh, Mick Crow came up to Tony in desperation he says give me my passport he says I'm out of here what's wrong with you Mick he says I'm out of here Jesus I'm out of here uh, apparently what happened at half time was that there was an announcement over the Tanai would Dr Mick Crow please report to the stewards office so, Mick, what happened was actually that the night before at two o'clock in the morning, a German chap who had a heart attack knocked on Mick Crow's door. He heard all the lads calling Mick doctor, you know, so he got knocked on Mick Crow's door and, and he says, her doctor, her doctor, heart attack, heart attack. So Mick was, was rooming with the chap who was a fitness fanatic. He gave him two of your man's fitness pills. He said, take those. He said, you'll be right as rain in the morning. So when he heard, when Mick heard the announcement over the tannoy, her doctor, he said, this guy is dead. Well, all of a sudden, they looked around, around the corner, came this guy, this German guy, as right as rain, threw his arms around, her doctor, her doctor. He said, you saved my life. He said, Tony told us that story, and it was priceless. Telling. It was great to tell a story, actually, Tony. Indeed he was. Now, uh, Mike Hearn is also on the line. Good morning to you, Mike. Hiya, Joe. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, this morning, this sad morning? Ah, it certainly is, Joe. I mean, it'd be 20 years next April since I first met Tony and started in radio, and it was him and Leonard Burke that uh, gave me my first chance at the media business. But I think the first thing that always stuck out in my mind about Tony is before we always went on air, I don't know whether it was a, a good luck ritual or, or what it was that he did, but he always used to comb his hair, and I used to always wonder why would Tony comb his hair when we were going on radio when nobody could see us. But, you know, he, he just always had a really smart appearance and he looked well and he was always really professional about his job. I mean, we worked very closely together on the weekend sports and even by his headlines, they were so imaginative, they were so colourful, full of alliterations and metaphors. And, you know, he'd captivate the audience right the very second he went on air. He, he was absolutely brilliant. And as the lad said, he had a razor sharp mind. I'll never forget one morning we were previewing a World Cup and Leonard Burke was having a slag off Tony about Ian Hart's inclusion in the Republic of Ireland squad. And, and he said, sure, Tony, Ian Hart isn't even related to a footballer. And as sharp as a whistle, Tony came back and said, well, he is actually because Gary Kelly's his uncle. You know, yeah. just, just sharpness like that. You, you'll never forget Tony for stuff like that. And, and his love for sport. As Teresa was telling us during the week, he'd, he'd be sitting down at home. He'd be reading the newspaper, the sports section. He'd have teletext on one television. He'd have a match on another. And he'd have the radio on with another match as well. And he was so full of knowledge about every sport. And he wasn't one to blow it out, you know, to everybody that would listen. But, you know, he'd always have the right thing to say at the right time. And, you know, he was a really, really good friend. And he was very, very good to me down through the years.
Uh, and Len, also um, worth remembering that he had another career, um, some might describe it as, in the real world, in the customs and excise. Oh, he was in the customs and excise, Joe, he was, yeah, and uh, very proud being in the customs and excise. But even there, he used to ball hop, Joe. I, I remember he was out in, uh, he was in Shannon he, at the airport, uh, and uh, the lads were coming back from one particular rugby trip, whatever it was. And Tony spotted two of the lads, two of the Bella lads, actually, you know. And he said to, to two of his colleagues, he said, no, he says, I want you to give these lads special attention. And Tony went into the back office, you see. So uh, the lads were going through the green, you know. And next thing, they were pointed to red, were come in, you know. So the two lads went into the room. <laughs> and one of the boys started putting on the gloves. <laughs> And they kept up that pretense for a while until Tony put his head around the door and <laughs> they F Tony out of it. <laughs> uh, well, let us uh, hear from the man himself talking about one of his great passions, which was horse racing. Winning, winning races is, is an inexact science and you must remember that. Um, but uh, I had my ups and I had my downs. I had some ones I, I'd like to remember, some I'd like to forget. Uh, but that's the nature of racing. But I, I haven't lost my love for it. I still love it. And I'm delighted to say that we're our, our, our new racetrack, not as new now as it was, but obviously it's still progressing. And hopefully uh, soon we'll have a, a brand new Greyhound racing track. Uh, well, you know, it might need a, a bit of tweaking at the moment, but hopefully uh, we'll have a brand new Greyhound racing track, uh, in, in, if not quite in Limerick, in its environs. And we'll be going to would be enjoying the same kind of facilities they have in Cork and they have in, in Galway and places like that, and I don't see why not. The late Tony McMahon talking about one of his great passions, uh, horse racing, but he had an interest in a range of sports, and I remember he taught me a crucial lesson in broadcasting, which was always respect the red light, whether it's on or not. <laughs> remember that you never know when the microphone is live and you might say something that you shouldn't stay. And indeed, his daughter, uh, Rachel, worked with us here at the radio station uh, in more recent years uh, as well. Uh, he had a, a fantastic interest in one of the great festivals of the summer, the Galway races. Uh, right. Yes, and himself and his brother, Richie, he was to regularly go. And of course, he always had the press pass for, for uh, working for the radio. And you'd see Johnny, uh, Tony in the in the in the parade ring, uh, uh, watching. And, and as Michael has said or, 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 or earlier on, he was always dressed superbly, and he he would be fit in with all the racing crowd, no bother. But he, as he was superb, but there was another area which we haven't touched on. We had a quiz that time. The interpub quiz and setting the questions we all wrote the questions but they all had to be checked Tony and myself you were you kind of took it upon ourselves I think to check the questions and he I go to his house at night and we'd maybe check a couple of hundred questions we'd check enough for three weeks and then we maybe next time he'd come to my house and we'd we'd spend hours getting books out double check and everything but this was Tony he did not want to make a mistake and it was great training for the rest of us we, we all learned from it and I, and I think it's one of the great but he was a character and he was a lovable character and I particularly I like to s- sympathise with the family because they've had a rough couple of years and Theresa you've been great and I think Paul and Rachel so I think uh, all of us have happy memories of Tony I know I have you brought in a lovely photo this morning, Len. Yes, that's a photograph, actually, Joe, of, as Ronnie was talking about those, that Guinness. Guinness used to sponsor that quiz. It was a huge quiz. We used to go around the various pubs. And that particular year, the final uh, finished out in the Green Hills. And the winning prize was, was uh, four FAI Cup tickets uh, that particular year to Wembley and all expenses paid. And that's when, when they, the FAI Cup, the final, meant the huge, the huge thing, you know. But uh, it was tremendous. We used to get great laughs out of it. But on that original team, Ronnie, of course, just looking at the, at the photograph now, Sean Murphy, uh, Lord of Sean, he was there. Leonard Burke was uh, the new member of the team. Uh, Tony, myself, Jim Upton, of course. Um, Tom Halpin was from Guinness. The late Tommy Hines, he was the man that started the sports team originally, Joe. Uh, he was he started us in Big L. He got us together originally, and uh, he was he was a great character. John the man himself, of course, and and uh, B J McAllister. But we had those quizzes were absolutely. 
they were fantastic. I remember Ronnie set the, set the, the questions one particular night, and and uh, I was the we used to take it in turns to do quiz master Joe. Uh, it, was, it was above in the Desmond pub, the high stool which is now closed. But I nearly got lynched. Ronnie, one of Ronnie's questions: Who came third in the nineteen nineteen fifty six Olympics in the fifteen hundred meters? No, okay, Ronnie, the lady won, won it. But who came third? You know, and he had number. Who came second? And I was nearly lynched. These guys came up to me afterwards because there was school teachers, four school teachers who used to follow us religiously, and they knew the pattern of the questions. Ronnie changed them completely. I got out of there very quickly. Tony actually made a very fast exit <laughs> <laughs> on the day. Well, uh, Tarlock has tested to say. Tony McMahon was a true sportsman and great sports reporter and knew his sport. Mike is asking, uh, can you ask Len about Tony slagging him about Deneen's disaster? Well, indeed, we talked about that. Kieran O'Brien says on uh, our Facebook page, Tony McMahon was a true gentleman and will be sorely missed. Uh, may he rest uh, in peace. And it should also be mentioned, of course, that he had an association with Young Monster Rugby Club. He had, he had a juvenile cup medal uh, with Young Monster Joe, so he was very proud of Young Monster. His son Paul played with Young Monster before he defected to Shannon, but uh, Tony was, uh, was always, he used to always say, how, how did our fellas do, you know? And he was, uh, of course, he was co-commentator with me in a number of matches, Joe. Uh, mm. We had some very ha- happy times on top of John McLaughlin's bus, the Aaron bus, doing the commentary. Uh, in the early days of the All-Ireland League, when he used to do uh, live commentary on, on those matches, Joe. I, uh, Memories, uh, great memories of Tony. And often after the sports programme on a Saturday morning, the two of you and uh, Leonard Burke and Mal Keaveney would go for, with Tony for, uh, for a coffee. Well, we'd always have the coffee, Joe. Yeah, we'd <laughs> uh, always. Mike, um, for you know, a, a younger member of the sports team like yourself, uh, Tony was a pioneer and, and has ensured that uh, the industry has thrived uh, in more recent times. Ah, certainly, Joe. I mean, you could learn absolutely anything from the man. I mean, I picked up so much from him on those Saturday and Sunday evenings, just watching his style and the ease at which he did it. And, and there was no pressure from Tony and he never felt pressure and he was well organised and, and he'd always teach you that, that, you know, once you're prepared for the bullet and nothing can go wrong, he'd never leave anything to chance. He'd always have enough to make sure we got through and he said, anyway, we'll sing a song if things don't go to plan. He never panicked. He could talk about any sport for as long as he liked and you know he was just an absolute gentleman to deal with there was never an angry word spoken he'd always make sure that you were looked after and you know Joe it's just very sad what he went through in the last number of years but the Limerick public should be absolutely thankful for what they had in Tony he he was a brilliant broadcaster he brought life to every sports event he went to and I was delighted that he saw Paul winning the All-Ireland Leagues with Shannon and of course his beloved Blanante Rovers picking up trophies locally and you know, I think one of the best memories I have of him was an interview that he did out at the new Limerick race course, the time when J.P. McManus wouldn't talk to a single person about Istabrak after he flopped at Cheltenham and then when he was retired. But Tony, as smooth as you like, you know, convinced J.P. to come into our hut out at Limerick race course and did a fabulous 10 or 12 minute piece with him. He just had that aura about him where he made people feel relaxed and he welcomed them. And, you know, he was just an absolute treasure to deal with. Uh, some more texts coming in this morning. Tony, a giant among men, a gentleman, a witty man, a decent man. Love being on the sideline. We'll miss him. Mac, give all my regards to the Bala boys up there, says Jerome Henry. And JP says, Tony McMahon was a legend and a gentleman. And that joke, Glenn told, Mick Crow told me that in a bar one night. And it's very fitting that you should uh, give Tony airtime today. Well, uh, of course, uh, something that we would always have done. Um, and there was something else that you wanted to mention, um, Ronnie. <coughs> We well, finish. the mention of his son Paul. Paul, of course, after finishing playing, ended up coaching Shannon. And uh, I think that, that gave Tony a lot of satisfaction, even though I think it was at the start of his illness. But he, he was, but he was a tremendous guy. He was, and he's, I, I think another occasion uh, where when I was in America with, when, when Frank O'Mara won his world indoor title, Tony insisted Tell, he told all the lads, you're not interviewing Ronnie and you come back, I'm doing it. But he was very interested in the thing uh, about my uncle who was looking after the, the great Stalin um, Northern Dancer. Uh, my, my, actually, my mother's brother, my uncle, uh, who's sent, now gone to God as well. But he, it, it, Tony was very interested. I went to see Northern Dancer. And he, that was really, one of the most famous stallions of all, of all time. time. Yes. Yeah. 
All right. Well, look, gentlemen, thank you all very, very much <coughs> for paying tribute to Tony. Um, I, I know the funeral arrangements can be heard on uh, our uh, obituary section and also at live95fm.ie. Uh, removal is from Thompson's on Friday uh, and then uh, the uh, Mass uh, on Saturday. And our deepest sympathies to all of his family and to his, his friends. And, and as you point out, Ronnie, a very difficult time for them over the last few years. But Tony will be fondly and oft remembered uh, by all of us as a pioneer in sports broadcasting in Limerick. Thank you, gents. Limerick Today on Limerick's Live 95 FM with Life and Soul, the guide to real life. Inside today's Irish Mail, a different view every day.